Dobar dan, poštovni gledalci. Ovo je Teša podcast. Naš današnji gost je gospodin Kit Klarenberg, istraživački novinar. Uh, Kit, thanks for being part of our podcast. Uh, let It's me first pleasure. introduce you. You are Kit Klarenberg, author at Grey Zone and investigative journalist. Recently, the very same. Yeah. Re- recently you have published an article on Grey Zone regarding the leaks uh, that were made by the Canadian mission uh, in Bosnia. What does those leaks tell us about the Bosnian war? Because basically from all the information that we got from those leaks, uh, there were some very uh, nasty hidden things like uh, CIA, black ops, false flag operations, illegal weapon shipments and important jihadi fighters. Let's first give it a context. How do these leaks dispel the myths that exist in the West about the Bosnian war? Well, I mean, I, I, I can't speak for your, for your audience's perception of what happened, but I mean, I'm old enough to remember the way that it was reported on by the BBC and other, you know, kind of uh, both state and corporate outlets um, in my um, my native England. And so, in effect, the, the narrative was that this was a war of, you know, imperialist genocidal aggression that was, specific, you know, kind of very, you know, wraith, racial or ethnic in nature targeting um, uh, Bosnia's Muslim population. Of course, you know, this is not true, but I think that the, these um, uh, these cables, and you know, there's a, the, hundreds and hundreds of pages of them, are so illuminating because they offer a, a kind of bird's eye, uh, you know, frontline view of what happened. These the, They were sent by Canadian UN peacekeepers, UN PRO, FOR, um, who were dispatched in the hope that they could prevent the outbreak of war. Um, at the start of 1992, um, it's it, they paint a very lurid picture of you know all of these different factors that you mentioned that are that did not appear in the media at the time, but were of course known to their HQ in Canada and also the various Western powers who were in charge of running these operations. So um, the I mean to take the example of the imported jihadist fighters, the uh, they're not referenced by name. Um, in they're, they're just referred to as the Muslims collectively. But these were Mujahideen fighters who were, uh, many of whom were veterans of the Afghan war, um, you know, which was another Western-backed proxy conflict um, uh, you know, versus the Red Army throughout the, the 1980s. Um, they very quickly in 1992 appear um, in Bosnia. Uh, there are questions abound as to how they got there. It seems as if they were being deliberately shipped in by the US and Britain, um, and indeed f- from you know, Britain itself, which was um, a, a kind of key training ground slash um, uh, sanctuary for these fighters once once their battles in Afghanistan were over. And the it, it's truly remarkable, the detail that you, that you get. So they frequently refer to how, you know, the, the, the Muslims collectively, that's, you know, their phraseology, have have in the past targeted their own people. They've blown up their own positions in order to further the narrative that, oh yes, the Serbs are evil and they're targeting civilians. And um, you know, in, in order to drum up sympathy for themselves and trigger Western airstrikes, there are numerous references to deliberate provocations against the Serbs, you know, like attacking um, uh, Serb encampments, um, Serb civilians, in the hope that this will provoke a massive uh, overreaction. Now, uh, it, it seems that for the most part, actually, you know, quite contrary to media characterization, the the, Ser- the Bosnian Serb army, and uh, which was, of course, backed by the um, the army of Yugoslavia to, to an extent, um, were restrained. They, you know, they knew what was, what they knew uh, the, the desired effect um, of these kind of uh, incendiary provocations, and they, you know, they, they, they didn't want to go there. So, yeah, it, it is very fascinating. It dispels an enormous number of myths. I am, you know, uh, disappointed but unsurprised that uh, th- this has been uh, ig- ignored by the mainstream media because to this day, you know, you have a panoply of Balkan experts, quote unquote, who, you know, continue to push, you know, discredited narratives and indeed outright lies about what happened. And, you know, this content fundamentally um, challenges their, their position and potentially threatens their uh, their, their paychecks. One of the main myths about the Bosnian war is uh, the way that the war started. Uh, basically, the mainstream media in the West are trying to hide the truth that the West has actually provoked the war. Absolutely. And I think that the, I mean, to, to, to give further context, and I think that even 
people who are old enough to remember, um, you know, the the uh, the death of Yugoslavia, that this might be slightly lost on them because this has been so successfully hidden. But in the throughout the 1980s, tick this gained in. Uh, intensity towards the end of the 1980s. The uh, CIA and MI6 and the German Foreign Intelligence Agency, the BND, were funding uh, separatist groups, many of them violent, many of them who had previously engaged in terrorist acts, such as Croatian separatist groups who'd you know, hijacked airliners in the 1970s and then um, gone into hiding. Um, in, in, in the expectation that one, you know, the start of the 90s would be the end of end of of communism everywhere, and it would be the, the triumph of uh, the US-led unipolar order. So, it, you know, I mean, this this worked in um, uh, Eastern Europe, courtesy of the CIA front, the National Endowment for Democracy. But because Yugoslavia was stable and it was economically prosperous and you know, people were happy, uh, it, this didn't happen. There was no mass movement to overthrow um, uh, the the, you know, the the order as established by Tito in, in the wake of wake of World War Two, and so when this didn't happen in 1990, the uh, the uh, the US passed a law called the Senate Appropriations Act. Now this banned Yugoslavia from receiving any Western aid, but also from trading. Um, with credits, uh, which is a very difficult thing to do, unless the constituent republics within Yugoslavia held referendums on independence and, you know, had quote unquote free elections. Um, you know, of course, um, you know, it, it, given that there were huge incentives for doing this, uh, those referendums were, you know, were, were convened. Um, and yes, the, the, the kind of the nationalists, um, you know, the kind of nationalist movements with the order of the day. Bosnia was very different because it was the most mixed and most uh, diverse republic within Yugoslavia. And actually, um, in the early 90s, people from elsewhere in Yugoslavia started moving there in large numbers because they felt that there was no way that it would descend into kind of fractious, fratricidal violence. They thought that, you know, this would be a kind of oasis of calm while everything else is breaking down. Um, it's rather depressing to consider that many of these people probably would have been killed um, as a result. But uh, anyway, so... The it, there was something called the uh, Filipovic um, uh, Karadzic Agreement, which was a proposal which was floated by the government of Yugoslavia to the devolved government of Bosnia, uh, that Bosnia would remain a sovereign component of Yugoslavia, free to make its own laws, and it would also be ceded um, Muslim-majority territory that was effectively under Serbian administration. Serbia was obviously the largest republic within Yugoslavia, although it's important to note that the government of Yugoslavia even then remained largely composed of Croats um, in a, an interesting historical uh, quirk. But anyway, so this deal was infinitely preferable to war. It was uh, it was agreeable to every side's interest. But bizarrely, um, uh, Alia, uh, the the Bosnian leader, um, uh, nixed this. He's, he he was initially supportive of it, but then you know opposed it. Subsequent to this, or every side, you know the Croats and the Muslims and and the, and the Serbs all started effectively preparing for war in a last ditch effort to prevent this from happening. The EU broke sorry, well sorry, the European Community, which is the forerunner of the European Union, brokered a deal. Um, whereby, yes, the, every side would have effective autonomy within the within the uh, the state of Bosnia, um, and this was you know, it wasn't perfect, far from it, but it, again, you know, preferable to conflict. Um, in late March 1992, on the on kind of the, the eve of, of this deal being signed, um, the U.S. ambassador. Uh, to, to to Bosnia, uh, Warren Zimmerman, um, he met with Alia and said, "We will." recognize your independence and we will give you unconditional military and economic support for rejecting this deal. So within hours of that meeting, um, it, the Alia duly rejected it and then fighting broke out. And yes, it, it's very clear um, that the, the, yes, the US was, was planning to support a, a long insurgency and they knew that the Muslims couldn't, um, uh, you know, effectively, uh, uh, defend themselves from a much larger and better equipped army, and uh, but they were nonetheless determined to prolong it for as long as possible in order to bring Yugoslavia to heel. So, the ambassador of the United States played a crucial role in the start of the Bosnian War. 
Absolutely, absolutely. And I think that, you know, this is, it's, it, 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 uh, questions can only abound as to whether there was also a US intervention to, to, to nuke the, the Fli Filipovich deal. Because, I, I mean, it's just, it doesn't make sense that, that you know, that this, uh, that, uh, that this wasn't accepted, um, you know, in, in the event when, you know, initially all sides were very keen on it. And yes, Bosnia would have been, you know, much safer and richer and um, more, you know, more, more prosperous, um, you know, w w had they accepted it, you know, e even irrespective of, of the uh, the long and grinding conflict that, that eventually came to pass. Uh, when the conflict started, basically, uh, the United States has pursued some kind of an anti serb policy. Uh, by by supporting one side in the war, they have basically prolonged the war until the 1995. So, what does this Canadian leaks tell us about that? Well, I mean, it's I mean, one of the really striking things is that the. Um, number one, the the files are littered with references to how um, the Muslims are losing um, and, and losing badly. But what's curious, and this isn't gone into in in detail in in the files, but you can kind of you know fill in the blanks yourself if you if if, if you know history, that the it, it states that the the Muslims were trying to negotiate as if they had won. And of course, you know, in the media, this was, the, the negotiations were always the fault of quote unquote Serb intransigence, you know, this refusal. But, you know, when someone's negotiating position is I want everything that I want and I don't want any, you to have anything that you want and I'm not gonna back down from that because I know that I can get all the weapons and money that I want from the CIA. Um, that's not really a negotiating position. You know, that's a declaration, um, an unbending declaration. And so, I mean, and so, yes, you know, the, you know, that is why talks kept breaking down. That is why the war lasted quite so long. And, you know, we see this dynamic play out in Kosovo where, you know, the KLA had explicitly been given, you know, an unconditional well of backing by uh, the CIA, I'm oh, sorry, by the US and Britain um, in secret. And, you know, they re were refusing to engage in any constructive talks um, with the, the government of Yugoslavia, um, uh, you know, at all. Um, and it, uh, it, the, the, the US even subsequently admitted that they had, had staged, um, uh, sorry, they had created a variety of traps for uh, Slobodan Milosevic to fall into. So, for instance, there's the, the Rambouillet um, acc Accords, which was a proposed, you know, peace plan um the terms were so ridiculous and unreasonable you know it would have granted nato soldiers the right to travel anywhere they wanted within um yugoslavia which you know, comprised serbia and montenegro and kosovo at that, at that time and um allowed them to uh um, immunity from prosecution for committing any crime now henry kissinger that you know well-known uh, lover of peace um, said that you know, no angelic Serb would ever accept this, and yes, I mean, I mean, I don't think any country in the world would would accept that. But you know, Milosevic's quite understandable rejection of it was um, uh, framed as you know dangerous brinkmanship and, and and belligerence. So I I think that this is another key thing to remember from these uh, to a key takeout from these files is that what happened in Bosnia set a blueprint for what. Uh, was to come both within what remained of Yugoslavia thereafter, but also you know, you know many other conflicts, whether it's Iraq, Afghanistan, um, you know Libya, Syria, like all of these Western usually proxy wars, and which you know quite strikingly have uh, required you know using jihadists as proxies um, in 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 many cases. Uh, one of the leaks says that satisfying Muslim demands will be the primary obstacle in any peace talks. So even the people who wrote these uh, documents knew that that strategy will only lead to prolonging of the war. Yeah, absolutely, and I, and I, I, th I mean, it, 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 the, the the one of what one another really well. I mean, this is a rather disturbing quirk of these files is that this uh, intelligence was not only being fed directly to um, uh, the Canadian government um, and the you know, Canadian military, but it was also being shared with the CIA. And I think that, you know, in the process, these Canadians um, made peace a lot more unwittingly, I might add, um, or the, uh, uh, you know, a lot harder to attain because, you know, this helped the US with targeting. It, it gave them, you know, um, guidance on how to, you know, continue scuppering peace talks, um, you know, uh, uh, but, all, but also, um, it, 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 it made a much more dangerous environment for um, uh, the, 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 the peacekeepers themselves because they were 
they uh, it seems quite clear that the, the Bosnian Serbs realized that these peacekeepers were effectively yes helping the, the Muslims but also um you know NATO NATO target Serb positions so then they they stopped trusting the peacekeepers and wanted nothing to do with them and then there's also the there was also there's also passages which refer to how uh, the, the 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 Bosnian Muslims were um dressing themselves up as UN um peacekeepers with you know like kind of blue helmets and painting UN symbols on, on on their vehicles in order to infiltrate Croat and Serb positions, and that you know therefore that created a situation by definition in which the, the you know various opposing sides didn't know who and who wasn't a peacekeeper and you know whether to open fire on them or not. Uh, one of the important things that you mentioned the, are the illegal uh, weapon shipments that happened with, under the uh, blessings of the um, CIA. Yeah, I mean, this started off as um, a, a kind of joint um, Saudi and Iranian operation. Um, and I, I don't think the Iranians still quite knew what they were getting themselves into. But the, 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 they came in, they, the, the, as they gained in uh, regularity and size, and bearing in mind this was completely illegal, there was a, a UN embargo on, 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 sending these, um, on, 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 on sending this arsenal at all. I mean, the, 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 the you know, aid was, was in theory restricted to strictly humanitarian things like you know, medicine and food. Um, the, the, as, yes, as they gained in um, regularity and size, the CIA stepped in and they were flown in on black Hercules aircraft to, to an airport in Tuzla. And the, um, uh, the, yeah, the, the, the purpose of them was, of course, to, yes, ratchet up tensions, you know, keep this going for as, for as, for as long as possible. What's interesting to note is the fact that quite clearly the, the CIA realized that they created a monster. So towards the end of the war, there are numerous references within the files to how um, the Mujahideen, uh, particularly the, the, the senior leadership of, 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 of the group, were being taken out. And um, they were, you know, in, in kind of assassinations, targeted strikes, and no one could, they can't quite work out who's behind this. Now, there are, from other sources, there are accounts from people who were fighters on the ground um uh um who f found what they what they called um a, a hostile environment beginning as um the Dayton accords are you know close to being finalized you know and on the day that that they are finalized again you know that people members of their leadership are assassinated um and so they start they attempted to flee bosnia a lot of them tried to go to albania or tried to go to kosovo um and then they ended up getting arrested by the cia en route because there was a burn notice on them now and many of them got deported back to their home countries many of them were tried under terrorist offenses and uh, convicted and received either lengthy jail terms or um, uh, were executed and um, it was this betrayal that led Osama bin Laden who was a major supporter of both the Mujahideen and the Kosovo Liberation Army to declare a fatwa on America which is you know what one way or another leads to 9-11 now you know, this is an example of CIA quote unquote blowback that's, that, that nobody knows about. It's never discussed, um, but it's, a, you know, it, 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 it had enormous um, influence over, and, um, over, the, uh, over the subsequent, uh, subsequent years in Europe and, and North America. So there is a connection between the Bosnian War and 9-11. Yeah. No, it's quite, it's wild, isn't it? Yeah, and it I is think, wild. Yeah, and it's like, you know, it, 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 what's, what's particularly striking about it is it created a situation in which, yes, that when the war on terror begins, you know, Afghanistan is, is invaded and all of these training camps are hunted down and, you know, all the, the, the alleged senior Al-Qaeda leadership are, um, are, you know, kind of arrested and taken to CIA black sites. Uh, you know, a lot of these people had been in receipt of weapons and funding from the CIA directly for many years previously. Uh, you mentioned some kind of uh, assassinations of the Mujahideen leadership uh, that were mysteriously happening during the war. Yeah, I, I mean, it's a it's a very striking feature, like not even the, the peacekeepers themselves, despite their kind of, you know, firsthand knowledge and you know, local networks providing the information quite knew what was happening. Um, I strongly suggest that that was the, um, you yeah, the CIA carrying out a, a mass cleanup operation. And I think, you know, the, the, the it's it's it, it's interesting how short people's memories are, because if this the presence of the Mujahideen there and their tendency to engage in, you know, horrific atrocities. Um, and yes, in kind of incendiary provocations, uh, was reported on by the mainstream media at the time. You can find British TV news reports 
you know, on this happening. Um, and yes, it, there was a, I, th I think it was a UN ambassador to Yugoslavia who said that the, um, the presence of the Mujahideen um, in the conflict was, you know, a, 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 a blight on Bosnia, which persists to this day. Um, and, you know, an, an arguable upshot of this has been an increasing um, level of uh, religious fundamentalism, or at least, you know, kind of uh, extremism is the wrong word, uh, maybe hardcore conservatism. There are a large number of, um, of places in Bosnia and Herzegovina, which, you know, very proudly boast signs outside saying that they don't serve alcohol and, you know, all these other, all these other things. Yeah, it was fairly new in the 90s. You didn't have that during the socialist period, you know. Indeed, yeah. indeed. And I think it's, I mean, this is another thing which is rather rather forgotten, which is, I mean, again, for all of the talk of Serb nationalism, as in Croatia, you know, Alia was a hardcore, um, you know, a Bosnian nationalist, but, you know, as, as, as much as that extended just purely to Muslims and, and had a history of, um, you know, public statements and, um, and and issuing writings, which were which you know, talked of the need for a um, solely um, Muslim state uh, within Europe, and um, uh, and you know, to, to rid Bosnian lands of, uh, of foreign invaders. And you know, this is you know talking about areas of of, of what we know as Bosnia, where Serbs and, and Croats had you know existed for centuries, you know, peacefully and stuff. So I think you know, in, in the manner of say Tudjman in Croatia, who is regarded as a freedom fighter. By by, you know, Western audiences when, I mean, he was possessed of an absolutely rabid nationalism and, you know, um, uh, the, things like Operation Storm, which was recalled the, the most effective ethnic cleansing in the Balkans by a, a UN official. Uh, these are all forgotten or celebrated. Um, and, yeah, and, you know, we only ever hear about, you know, Serb nationalism. What about Bosniak nationalism? What about Croat nationalism? Because it, during the, the Yugoslav period, there was no such thing as a Bosniak. There were just, you know, Muslims who lived within the the, wi the wider system, and you know, happened to have slightly different customs to the Orthodox and, and uh, Christian and Catholics who they lived along alongside. Uh, how were the Mujahideen described in these leaks? Uh, uh, as a hostile or benevolent force? So Oh, it's overwhelmingly hostile, and I think that the you can you can tell that there was an enormous amount of distrust and and kind of dislike of these elements by the peacekeepers. So, I mean, if you look at the McCall um, incident, um, and you know, for for those who are unaware, this was the purported bombing of yeah, a that, that's a, yeah. oh, another sorry. very important point of false flag attacks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think that's. I mean, these kind of these points are interrelated. Yeah, so, they are. They are. They yeah. Are. So, I think that, that yeah, effectively. Um, it, it, it was widely understood that you know false flags were the mujahideen's um, stock in trade. It was something that they 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 did um, uh, over and over again. They were unconcerned about civilians, including their own civilians, um, you know, getting killed in the process. Um, there there are clear indications that various kind of massacres of civilians were either you know stage managed or um, were you know actively encouraged. Um, by you know um, opposing sides in the conflict, which is you know quite disturbing. Um, but it, it, if you look at McCall, this was an incident in which um, there was a bombing of a civilian market. Now it's it doesn't seem to have been conclusively proven who or what was behind it. So there were n multiple official investigations to what happened that all had inconclusive results. Um, that there, there was. A you know a Bosnian Serb official who was convicted of this by the international um, you know a, a criminal tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. Um, th there were people who testified at their trial, including U uh, Canadian peacekeepers, who said they thought it was fired from a Bosnian sorry a, a Bosnian Muslim position. Um, in the files themselves, when we talk about these incidents, they refer to a number of quote unquote disturbing aspects of the Makal incident, and you know they're apparently within very very quickly after, and you know suspiciously quickly after it happened the area was crawling with um the bosnian um, um, military so you know they weren't there and the second it happened suddenly there you know it can be found in profusion 
but also the fact that you know journalists were led very quickly to you know there was no attempt to you know secure the crime scene or whatever and you know that there are clear hints and it was it seems that the, the canadian peacekeepers were quite convinced that this was a yes a false flag attack that was was specifically done to engender sympathy and attention and, de and you know, further demonize the serbs there is a very revealing sentence um in one of the cables where they talk about how alia and his army are trading on the image in the West of uh, Milosevic as, as, as a villain. And so, of course, in that context, you would want to do everything in, in, that you possibly can, directly or indirectly, to further this perception. Uh, yes, uh, because uh, these four flag attacks were actually needed in order to justify the Uh, military intervention uh, by the West in the Bosnian War. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And I think again, you know, an another you know close parallel to this is the war in Kosovo, where it has been admitted by uh, Hashim Thaci, who subsequently he was a KLA fighter who subsequently became a you know a Kosovan leader, um, that they were explicitly told um, that you need a minimum of about five thousand deaths in Kosovo before we can start you know issuing condemnations in the UN. Um, and you know it was very clear that yes that the, the their strategy was to you know target civilians both Serbs and, and Albanians in Kosovo um, and you know, ratchet up the violence provoke excessive reactions um, you know up the bloodshed and then intervention can come and then oh you know we're, we're, we're saving lives I mean you know never mind the, the fact that British officials openly admitted that the KLA was prior to NATO intervention responsible for the, the overwhelming majority of the deaths in Kosovo at that time you know um, it, 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 it's a very effective means of triggering um, Western intervention which the West encourages its various proxies to do and so I mean and again like I said we see this blueprint playing out subsequently in so many news stories uh, to, to emanate from the Ukrainian um, uh, conflict seem uh, specifically concerned with uh, yes um, you know, minting the same narrative so if you look at in uh, in late March there was there was an incident where a, it, it, a, it appears whether it was a missile or a shell um, uh, or an airstrike um, isn't clear. There are indications it wasn't an airstrike, including a, um, a, 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 a witness on the ground. But the, uh, there was uh, there was a, there was a, a, an incendiary strike on a um, ho uh, on or near a, ho a maternity hospital in Mariupol um, in you know southern Ukraine. This was framed in the media as you know a deliberate attack on you know wounded people at a medical center as part of a kind of wider genocidal campaign against uh, the the civilian population of Ukraine now it's become very very clear and i've reported on this for gray zone that actually the that hospital complex was effectively f emptied of patients and it was being used as an informal headquarters by the ukrainian military which is illegal under international law it's a war crime to use civilian infrastructure um and in, uh, it's to, to uh, you know to process a conflict and so um you know that that's very different from oh well this was a deliberate strike on on a maternity hospital just specifically to kill people in labor um you know uh but this was rather lost um in mainstream media coverage And so, yes, again, we see this blueprint playing out over and over again. And it's particularly interesting to note that um, some individuals who've been involved in setting up uh, ICTY-inspired uh, uh, prosecutions of um, kind of Western enemies, such as, you know, the government of Syria, are also active in the Ukraine conflict now. You, you mean uh, the Mr. Jeffrey Nice? Yes, like the, yes, some of these the same names keep cropping up, and you know, quite intriguingly, they're they're, they're British, um, you know, by and large. But the, I, I, it, it is, it, it, it's, it, it, I, I think that th these files are so important to focus on because they show that, you know, events uh, you know, within a within that occur under the fog of war are always going to be contested and uncertain. But the way they are presented in the media and by Western leaders then becomes established history. And it becomes kind of you know axiomatic within textbooks. Actually, the truth is a lot more complicated, um, and often the truth is you know the exact opposite of what um, established te uh, history textbooks say. Uh, it's interesting that in one of the leaks, it's mentioned that the uh, Bosnian uh, Muslim forces have placed their artillery uh, near the hospitals. 
Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, and, and there, there was all, I mean, the, the, one of the most striking passages is where they talk about um, uh, uh, the, the Muslims planning a, a, a strike on um, uh, Sarajevo airport, which is where, you know, humanitarian, humanitarian aid was, was, was flowing to. And, you know, they, um, and they, it was on, it was felt by the peacekeepers that this would be, you know, a prime target, quote unquote, because, you know, then this can be framed as, oh, the Serbs are preventing food and you know, vital supplies reaching these poor people. Um, you know, again, I mean, it's similar to say like in the Syrian conflict where, you know, Barack Obama said, well, you know, a chemical attack would be a red line and this would trigger intervention. And then, you know, lo and behold, suddenly all of these rather dubious chemical attacks start cropping up in profusion. And it's like, well, I mean, if you tell people, okay, well, we're going to bomb your enemies if this happens, then they'll make that thing happen. You know, it's uh, such as the logic of uh, proxy war. Yeah, like you mentioned, uh, there is data that there was a some kind of a plan for some kind of a false flag attack on Sarajevo airport. Yes, absolutely, and uh, yes, the the the, the 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 Muslims were specifically citing, uh, you know, their artillery and their positions near civilian structures like you know libraries, hospitals, etc. And and yes, in many cases, this is you know understood in in mainstream narratives about the war in Bosnia to be deliberate Serb and Croat. Um, strikes, um, you know, f for the purposes of just, you know, sadistic destruction. It's not true. Uh, also, uh, there are mentions of the uh, Muslim forces firing their own people. Yeah, indeed, indeed. And it's like, yeah, it's, um, it's what, what, what's really interesting as well is that when you when you read a lot of these um the, the, these cables and then you look at what was you know, as, you know uh, what, what what transpired at the icty i mean my own view and this is the view of several several legal scholars is that the icty was effectively a kangaroo court that was concerned with trying as desperately as possible to reinforce existing narratives about what happened and in many cases failing um you know there were numerous n numerous uh, people on you know on uh, within the croatian army and within the the, uh, the bosnian army who you know pretty much provably committed absolutely sickening war crimes and you know, they were never prosecuted or they were prosecuted and then those prosecutions failed or they were convicted and then these convictions were overturned and it you know overwhelmingly focused on um, you know purported serb crimes and i think if there were numerous interventions by us officials to prevent say the kla being um held to account for their murderous actions but the, the it, what's quite striking is that actually despite you know an enormous amounts of money and 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 time and energy being invested in trying to um, uh, identify, if not outright concoct, the evidence that would reinforce these charges. In many cases, they failed miserably. And I think, you know, one of the, it, it, you know, the, what, Milosevic, for example, was originally up on charges of having been involved in a joint criminal enterprise to create a, a greater Serbia and and had, you know, um, uh, and for uh, encouraging and helping execute ethnic cleansing. And the court was actually forced to admit that he had been, you know, critical of, 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 of this proposal. Um, you know, in 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 many cases, this, uh, you, know, you know, this this occurred in, you know, overwhelmingly, um, uh, you know, th th there were there were many cases of, um, you know, th th what was framed as ethnic cleansing being Serbs, you know, regaining territory that, that they had, you know, either abandoned or or lost in fighting. Um, you know, again, who is the aggressor here? Who is the who is the imperialist? Uh, uh, one of the key issues in these leaks is also the data about the 1993 ceasefire and the uh, uh, breaking of the ceasefire by the Muslim Bosnian forces. Oh uh, yeah, indeed, and it's they um, they mention you know as they head towards the winter of 1993 when this was when there were desperate attempts to forge a new peace plan, um, which the, the the details of which were you know the, the the Bosnian Serbs were very much on board with. You know they wanted the fighting to stop, they didn't want it to continue, and yeah, the the uh, that you know part of of the uh, the pro this 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 process was uh, of, of minting uh, this peace plan was a ceasefire now yes they i think they were I think the exact language is um the muslims have been the most prolific breakers of the ceasefire the mo or the most uh uh uh, uh common uh, because actually 
um, the, the the Serbs had been respecting it. And again, within that, there was you know, an awful lot of provocation. There were attempts to trigger Serb counterattacks, which you know, which would be in breach of the ceasefire. Um, and they were, quote unquote, restrained. I, I mean, um, yeah, so, I mean, and, and then when finally this, this, this peace process failed, I mean, again, you know, this was due to unyielding Bosnian demands. Um, and uh, as I say, uh, it, it met the cables make clear that, they, that the the peacekeepers thought that this this position was uh, the, the Bosnians' um, uh, negotiating position was uh, appalling because they were yes negotiating like they'd won when they were losing terribly. Um, you know, I mean, and actually, the, if, if it had not been for um, you know a, a, a massive. Um, you know, NATO N NATO bombing campaign, Bosnia, and also yes, op the aforementioned Operation Storm in in Croatia. Uh, they they would have lost. Uh, you know, I mean, <laughs> it, 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 we see we kind of see this in Ukraine, where we you know you know Ukraine would have lost you know, months ago were it not for the steady flow of of you know of Western arms and, and financial aid, but they just keep on going, and more and more people keep dying. Um, you know, but it's absolutely it's a tragedy. But you know, the people who orchestrate this aren't aren't affected by it, and they don't care. So, in yes, in effect, the ceasefire was finally broken by um, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know um, conclusively because because talks broke down. But with, in leading up to that, there was an enormous amount of provocation and um, you know, yes, attacks on on Serb positions in the hope that they would. Uh, uh, retaliate, but then this was unforthcoming typically. Uh, also, there is a mention of the uh, situation around the Igman mountain area and the uh, way that the Muslims have broken the uh, ceasefire around that mountain. Yeah, I mean, like Aikman Mountain is—I um, mean, it's, it's very beautiful, but the uh, it, 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 it was a contested it was a contested space because, of course, it gave a perfect bird's eye view of. Um, uh, you know, um, uh, of, of the ground below, um, and it was you know pretty unassailable. It's difficult to get you know lots of men and material and, and, and vehicles you know up there in in uh, in large numbers. It, but yeah, I mean, this is just you know again and again and again that these these files are full of you know references to this sort of thing happening. Either these events are forgotten now. Um, entirely, or yes, this it 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 it, 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 it is framed as, or you know, kind of, or it is cemented as, uh, oh, well, you know, this was a this was a Bosnian Serb war crime, or this was a, a Bosnian Serb strike. But the, the 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 cables make clear that this was either you know contested or what, yes, was a a false flag. It's interesting to draw the parallels between the situation in Bosnia. Uh, 20 years ago, and the situation now in Ukraine, are there similarities? Yeah, absolutely. And I, th I mean, I, I mean, as as I say, I mean, there are moves to set up a, some kind of mechanism to prosecute Russian officials. I'm not sure how that would work. Maybe they would be tried in absentia, or, or you know, it would be hoped that that they are overthrown and then deported by whoever replaces them. I think you know, fat chance on that on that front. Um, I mean, real, but yes, that the as I say, there are numerous individuals and organisations uh, who are drawing on the ICTY as an inspiration um, in, in in order to. Uh, yes, prosecute officials, but also yes, like you know, min media narratives. What's quite striking is there's an NGO called Truth Hounds, um, which is run by the National Endowment for Democracy, uh, which is you know collecting uh, purported evidence of, um, of of Russian war crimes. There's no indication that Ukrainian war crimes, which are you know many in number and you know are very easy, it's very easy to find evidence supporting supporting that conclusion. Um, but the, the mainstream media is of course not interested because it doesn't fit the narrative. Um, you know, there's no indication that they're going to be gathering evidence for the yeah, the trials of Ukrainian officials. You know, it's all it's all one way, and I think this is exactly what happened in um, in Yugoslavia. And you know, critics of the ICTY made the point that you know it was overwhelmingly um, you know Serb officials who were were prosecuted. To which you know. Um, uh, and the response was, "Oh well, it's because you know that they committed the most crimes." Again, these files make make clear that is absolutely not the case. And I think that yes, that if you, I mean, you know, as an example, if you if you look at the uh, civilian um, death toll over the course of the war, um, according to the UN, it's it's oh sorry of the Ukraine uh, the war in Ukraine, it's nine thousand, um, which is about. 
as many people died in you know um in every month in the initial phases of the iraq war but you know that's a, I, I digress the it, 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 the ukrainian figures for um not only civilian casualties but also how many russians they killed are completely crazy it's like you know hundreds of thousands of people i think they said that it was 120,000 in maria pole um uh, you know, alone, which is just, you know, just clearly not true. But that line is being stuck to by the media. And I would suggest that any resultant tribunal um, covering the Ukraine conflict would probably use those figures. Yeah, because there were calls to establish an international uh, war crime tribunal uh, in order to trial, the, for example, Putin. It was a statement made by Jeffrey Nice in the yeah. spring of last year. Yes, indeed. And it seems that various European countries, you know, France and the Netherlands are leading the charge. But I think that there's there's, there's noises on both on the, in both Britain and the US as well to this effect. They're going to set up some kind of of body to to try, um, yes, Putin and you know, uh, and uh, Lavrov et al for for their involvement in this. I mean, I think. You know, again, you know, in in in, the, in 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 keeping with you know maintaining narratives, I think the ICTY was you know, a massive failure. It you know it didn't achieve its objectives. It didn't, in every case, um, you know, uh, it, 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 it didn't uphold justice, and it also didn't serve the interests of peace and reconciliation. You know, um, and but but but. Western leaders, because it was so high profile and because, you know, that they, they kind of have a vested interest in deluding themselves at this point, they like to think that it was highly successful. You know, this was this tremendous um, example of you know, international justice being served for, for war criminals. I mean, the obvious question of why um, there's no, there was no tribunal over the Iraq war where you know, millions of people died is, uh, is an open one. But, you know, the answer is pretty obvious, I would say. But it's, yeah, the, the, it, the, it seems to have been a, a, a bug, call it, or a, uh, a trend that the, uh, the, the Western powers want to push. As, a, you know, as an example of this, in, uh, in the, yeah, as I mentioned the, you know, how there was a, 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 what they called an entrepreneurial justice operation set up to prosecute Syrian officials. The EU and other Western governments pumped vast sums into creating this, into funding organizations to gather evidence of war, of alleged war crimes in Syria. Um, in the event, one Syrian official who, I might add, um, initially defected to the West and um, yeah, uh, you know, uh, gave MI6 and the CIA a large amount of information, was tried in a German court. The trial was a farce. Um, and in the end, they got five years. I mean, you know, that's not a success. I mean, that's a miserable, miserable failure. But, you know, these, the, clearly the people pushing this haven't gotten the message. Also, another line that is uh, uh, connecting the uh, war in Ukraine and war in Bosnia is the fact that it's basically a U.S. proxy war. Indeed, indeed, and I think that the you know that um, there were that the, 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 there's a line by Michael Parenti where he says that you know the, the 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 empire feeds off the republic and the republic is always clearing up the crimes and the and the mess made by the empire. And I think that's kind of apropos here. It, it, th- th- this started off as you know a cia mi6 proxy war and there there are some indications that the, the, the leaders of their, their respective countries weren't actually aware of what was going on um and so these uh, you know the, these uh, regional conflicts descending into outright chaos due to uh, the intervention of of um, west intelligence agencies prompted um you know elected politicians to you know uh, take action or you know demand that action be taken um it, it, it but you know the, the a, a a proxy war model minted in afghanistan uh has you know has been exported across the world ever since you know you don't have to get your hands dirty you don't need to do any fighting or cost any of your own civilians lives you just get other people to do it for you um you know, I, again, this is based on a flawed, a, f- a very flawed conception of history because the you know, neoconservatives in America like to think that, oh, right, well, you know, we funded the Mujahideen and this was the end of the Soviet Union. You know, the war was was uh, le- what led to its collapse. Actually, more kind of sober minded um, CIA analysts at the time, including, uh, I believe his name is Melvin Goodman, who was the head of the CIA's Russia desk um, at that, or the, so- the Soviet Union desk at this time, th- thinks that actually it didn't really achieve very much and it, and it wasn't what 
you know, precipitated the Soviet Union's downfall. But again, you know, Western leaders have convinced themselves that this is the case, so therefore it, it is. And, you know, in the lead up to the, the Ukraine conflict, you know, people like Hillary Clinton, you know, who you know, boasted of Gaddafi's death saying, you know, we came, he saw, we, we came, we saw, he died, you know, just while, while laughing because it's you know, so hilarious. Um, she and you know, many others were citing the support for the Mujahideen in the 1980s as a model to follow. And they, you know, the plan was to you know, flood Ukraine with Western weapons and see what happens. Well, I mean, we're seeing what happens. They've run out of ammunition. They're running out of, of, of vehicles um, and they're quickly running out of people. Yeah, now they're going to send the Abrams uh, like 31 pieces of it and... UK will send like 14 tanks. Yes, so indeed. that will change their Oh, absolutely. The oh, I think that's, that's going to be the real game changer. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. I mean, and, and, you know, a lot of these tanks are not going to reach Ukraine for, you know, another year or two. I mean, whether there'll still be a country left then, I don't know. But uh, yeah, it's uh, it's interesting, isn't it? Uh, we talked about the CIA. We talked about uh, the Canadian peacekeepers. But what we didn't mention here is the role of UK. Of course, there isn't much in the Canadian leaks about the UK role. Yeah, well, I mean, I think like Britain's role in this war is, I think it's a perfect example of how um, you know, the, the Iranians refer to the US as the great Satan, you know, this kind of grand monster, whereas the, they, they say the UK is the is the cunning fox, you know, there's this kind of you know, conniving um uh you know manipulative characters so the 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 as i mentioned mi6 was funding and training and arming separatist groups within yugoslavia during the 80s alongside the cia and bnd um they also uh were deployed peacekeepers to yugoslavia uh not through the un but of you know of their own um volition and these peacekeepers were aware that that the, your all out war was going to break out they did plenty to try and provoke it they they you know attacked serb positions uh but then they also planned to um uh evacuate uh because they knew that uh there would be massacres impending you know you know, not least due to the provocations they helped they they helped carry out and encourage um, yeah, I mean, you know, MI6 had a, a, a huge vested interest in this happening. British leaders were officially anti, um, uh, you, know, it, you know, direct intervention, and even were not keen on you know, NATO airstrikes in the country. And so, yes, you have all of these different agencies and all these different entities um, pulling in different directions and carrying out, um, uh, you know, both covert and overt actions, which were making the conf making the conflict worse. I mean, quite horrifically. I mean, this is you know, particularly disturbing, given that Western leaders now uh, visit uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina and talk about you know the, the need for its the necessity for its sovereignty to be you know respected and upheld, and uh, you know the you know the dangers of foreign meddling in Bosnia. Um, you know, it, 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 there are. I mean, this is purported by uh, Bill Clinton that the British, along with the French, actually wanted uh, Bosnia to become fully or almost fully Serb, because, or you know, Serb and Croat, because they they didn't want a Muslim state in Europe. They wanted a quote unquote painful but necessary restoration of Christian Europe. You know, I mean, so uh, I mean, you know, in the wake of this, uh, a variety of of British uh, spies and officials made an enormous amount of money uh, through the privatization of, of former state entities in Bosnia and then in Kosovo and then in Serbia. So I think you can see that their uh, their self interest in um, in fomenting this. So there were actually the ex uh, British officials who. Uh, had a great financial gain from the privatization in this area. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, and I think you know it, it's. It, it, the, the, I mean, if you go down to um, you know the, the the hated Belgrade waterfront, there is a you know a giant um, uh, the skyscraper that's been erected. That is on the site of um, which is you know going to be luxury housing and and, and uh, a shopping mall and uh, and yes, um, most people I speak to here say it looks like a giant dildo and they hate it. And like, <laughs> yeah, and, uh, it does. Yes, it does, doesn't it? And like, uh, but but the, the I think that like what's really striking is that that was erected on the site of a you know, uh, of a um, NATO uh, bombing. And there couldn't be a more kind of visceral manifestation of how the war in Yugoslavia from the West perspective was about enforcing capitalism at the, you know, the barrel of a gun 
Prover, you know, a proverbial gun, so to speak. And you know, like, I mean, you know, Madeleine Albright, who was the architect of the war in Kosovo, and uh, you know, she profited handsomely from the privatization in Kosovo, but you know, through through an investment fund, you know, that she ran. So yeah, I mean, you know, on a both on a wider kind of ideological and economic level, the West had an interest, but Western officials had a you know a direct personal interest in this happening. Um, and I think. You know, uh, perhaps the war in Ukraine shows that that you know particular grift, that you know bloody violent grift, has you know reached an end point. Although, yes, there are discussions of how to you know massively profit from the reconstruction of Ukraine and you know mass privatization and digitization there. So you know we, we shall see. Yeah, they already have given up on the agricultural land. You know, they are like buying it in uh, great quantities during the period of the war. Oh yeah, well I mean I, I mean this is a very striking feature that the you know the, the the constitution of Ukraine in keeping with Belarus and Russia prohibited uh, this is sorry pre-made sorry I should add uh prohibited the private ownership of arable land um and key state you know key key resources such as energy like that all had to be in the hands of the state um that you know one of the first acts of the US installed government um in in Kiev uh in uh, early 2014 was to tear up that constitution and replace it with an almost identical document but all of the references to privatization have been removed and you know almost immediately you know uh, Ukraine's ro- you know vast uh wheat fields etc you know it was called the the bas- uh, the bread basket of the union um during the, the the USSR period uh for a reason was all handed over to Monsanto so you know there we are exactly and um, this brings us to an, a very interesting subject and that is the article that you have written about the UK intelligence uh, creating a secret army in Ukraine. Uh, there are some parallels there with the Bosnian war, basically. Yeah, absolutely. And so, I mean, and and uh, you know, I, I, as I say, there was there, there 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 was training of of separatist movements, but you know, this was the creation of secret armies. You know, that the frequently when people talk about the wars in Yugoslavia, they refer to oh, you know, the Croat army versus the Yugoslav army. The Croatian army was an illegitimate. Uh, you know, a, a f- f- foreign created entity. You know, in Yugoslavia, there was the Yugoslav army. Um, and of course, you know, in that context, when through brute force, uh, parts of, of a, 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 a federal republic are trying to break away, of course, you send in the federal army. I mean, as, as the US would, if, say, a Chinese or Russian trained and funded militia in Texas was trying to secede from um, the US, they would send in the National Guard or e- even, yes, the US military. But so, yes, it, 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 I've reported on for Grey Zone um, a large number of um, leaked files and emails, which are very revealing. And they document how individuals within Britain's military and intelligence structure, you know, very senior, you know, veteran people, including an MI6 operative who was uh, in, involved in the breakup of the Soviet Union, called Guy Spindler, um, they are attempting to build a secret partisan terror army in Ukraine, and this is on behalf of the uh, the security service of Ukraine's Odessa branch, and uh, this is specifically to carry out sabotage and incendiary attacks um, uh, th- you know, th- um, in in the event of Russian occupation um, uh, of you know what is you know, theoretically or at least you know kind of on a map um, Ukrainian territory, but it's historically Russian. Um, yeah, the 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 the, 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 the yes, uh, uh, you know, and a key target is Crimea. And you know, interestingly, these people in their private com- communications talk about how J- uh, Joe Biden's quote unquote caution must be challenged at all costs, and the the only way to win this is to just to escalate, escalate, escalate. And as such, they planned uh, these these same officials planned stuff like the 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 Kerch Bridge bombing, and uh, which you know resulted in a massive retaliation from Moscow as it was always going to. I I mean, these these people have no consideration for human life. They wanted to go a lot further than what actually happened. Um, the original plan for the Kerch Bridge bombing was to um, uh, strike its uh, the pillars that hold that kind of suspend the structure uh, to you know cause it to collapse. You know, strike it with an underwater drone, or you know attach explosives to it, or or uh, or uh, strike it with a missile, and this would have caused the entire yeah, structure to collapse. And and given that this is used by thousands of people every day driving to and from mainland Russia, 
uh, you know that that could have been thousands of people killed. I mean, you know, what would have been the the, the counter response to that? I, you know, I, 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 the, the, I, uh, there was another uh, kind of uh, alternative plan f for doing this, which involved um, uh, sailing a boat packed with ammonium nitrate under the structure and then detonating it. And they approvingly cited the the 2020 Beirut blast, which killed hundreds of people, injured thousands, and caused you know untold uh, amounts of damage to the capital of Lebanon. Um, you know, as it, uh, which I think raises questions about who or what what was really behind that. But you know, again, it's like you know this would have killed an enormous number of people and led to an enormous number of people dying in response. Um, you know, quite strikingly, the the uh, commemorative postage stamp of the Kerch Bridge bombing, which was issued very quickly within hours of uh, the explosion uh, there, showed uh, two blasts, uh, fiery blasts, on the pillars of the structure on either side, which is obviously not what happened, but tallies very exactly with, with Britain's plan. Um, or at least initial plans. So, I, I mean, you obviously wonder whether this was explored and, and uh, was just jettisoned for some reason. Another um, very interesting aspect to this, though, is that the, what seems to have actually transpired is that a truck full of explosives was hired from Odessa to go through a number of countries, including Bulgaria, to, go, to get into Russia and then travel over the bridge and was then detonated. Now, during Britain's dirty war in Northern Ireland throughout the 70s, the 80s, 80s and the early 90s, Britain, uh, British intelligence had a strategy called the human bomb where they would strap someone into a car laden with explosives and force them to drive into a military checkpoint. And then this would, yes, like, you know, result in civilian and soldier deaths and would be used to justify brutal crackdowns against the region's uh, you know, uh, minority Catholic population. Uh, you know, that sounds very familiar to what actually happened. And uh, uh, in creating this uh, a, a secret army in UK, there is a great role of this uh, company called Prevail Partners. Yeah, Prevail, the Prevail Partners are very interesting. I mean, I, I, I'd not heard of them before this uh, material was leaked to me, but they are a private military company which um, uh, Britain is a key exporter of these abroad. They are comprised of former special special uh, uh, forces operatives like you know, the Special Air Service, the Special Boat Service, SAS, SBS, uh, you know, no, you know, world, you know, known worldwide um, for their kind of daring actions. And they um, uh, have been heavily involved in the prosecution of Brit Britain's contribution to the proxy war. Yes, on top of you know planning the Kerch Bridge bombing and training this partisan terror army, they have also been supplying to the Britain's Defence Intelligence Agency and Ukraine and MI6 uh, what uh, a technology created by Anomaly Six, which is a private U.S. spying firm. This technology, using anonymized smartphone data. Uh, well, in theory, anonymized smartphone data can pinpoint millions of different devices, drill down into who owns them, where they live, you know, the identity of their family, uh, where they work, all sorts of things. Uh, it's really frightening. And, and they are providing this to, as I say, um, uh, DIA and, uh, and, and Kiev. Now, because it's so precise and it tracks someone's movements in real time, so if I was to track your phone using this, I would you know, see you come to the studio and then you go home and then your favorite restaurants and all these other... You know, so really, you can see everything that yes, I do, basically. Yes, absolutely. It's, I mean, it's just, it's deeply disturbing. And you know, they, call, uh, they call someone's home a bed down location because they judge how long a phone's been there. And then they say, well, that, that's where they sleep. Uh, it's, yeah, it's deeply creepy and um uh, uh, you know this raises the obvious question of whether it was used say in the assassination of daria duggan because you know that required them to know where she was and you know where her car was and all this other, you know this other information uh you know, has it been used to track the movements of alleged uh quote unquote collaborators in russian territory uh, you know, these people are routinely uh, murdered by uh, Ukrainian soldiers, um, or at the very least, kind of you know, tortured and jailed. Uh, in some cases, just because you know, a teacher kept teaching their kids while the area was under Russian administration. Uh, you know, uh, and th what's even more disturbing is the fact that this data can be quite imprecise. So, in our first story at the Grey Zone on on, on this. We reported a case study which tracked the, the alleged movements of, an, of a U.S. academic to and from North Korea. Now, we got in touch with him, of course, because, you know, 
his, his the names and in, uh, of his children were included in the the information that they dug up on him and, and photos of them and where they went to school and university and we thought this was very disturbing he better know and he strenuously denied going to north korea i mean he's either lying or they got the wrong person somehow and so this raises the very obvious prospect of innocent ukrainians and russians being killed but again you know the people running this don't care they're psychopaths Yeah, so the software can go wrong and still, yeah, you're going to suffer the consequences. Absolutely, absolutely. I, I think, we could, I think we, we, you know, one can only hope that this is all over sooner rather than later. Uh, the intelligence services played a great role in the Bosnian war because a lot of these things uh, that we talk about were prepared in the shadows by them. Uh, what is the role of the British intelligence uh, in the Bosnian war? Well, I mean, I think I've, I've kind of I've already gone over this, but like, I mean, I think that the that really that their uh, you know that their, their, their core contribution and their core objective here was to yes bring Yugoslavia to heel, but also make Bosnia easier to uh, to penetrate for British business um, for you know, for British security and intelligence services um, and for quote unquote British influence. Now, um, of course, within a you know quite powerful independent um, confederation of different states this was difficult and again you know you see this legacy uh, today and, and a story that I've got coming very very soon it may, it, 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 uh, you know, it, it may be published by the time this goes out there is um, uh, uh, during the pandemic uh, the British government in secret ran ran a psychological warfare operation to terrify residents of Bosnia into complying with COVID restrictions. Yeah, which... That is a very interesting subject. I think when your article gets released that we should create a show specifically dedicated to that, but you, you can yeah. tell a little bit. Yeah, well, I mean, I, you know, I, I, I won't go into, into too, yeah. much, too much detail, but I just think that, you know, the files in my possession talk about how they, how they manage this and how they've been managing, yeah. managing the Bosnian government's communications. Now, I mean, A, nobody knows about this, but B, I mean, you know, that's quite sinister and it, it effectively means that you know, the, the, the British government can propagandize the, the population of Bosnia directly, you know, in order to try and, you know, coerce them into, into uh, you know, behaving and thinking as they want. They want. And, you know, the, the, there are numerous um, similar projects all over the world that I've reported on where they are, they're, they're referred to as, as, you know, aid projects or, you know, support projects, but they amount to infiltration, you know, and it's like, in Lebanon, for instance, um, Britain runs a number of programs to infiltrate, uh, you know, Beirut's uh, security and intelligence services, and then they run them. And then, th therefore, in that process, you know, like the police aren't up for election, spies aren't up for election. You know, the, if the government changes due to democratic vote, they stay there, and the, and the British are in control of them. What does that tell you? You know, it's neo-colonialism. It is uh, British Empire 2.0. They are secretly governing these countries in their own interests or trying to. Uh, before we end this conversation, just to mention another very important point, and I think we should dedicate a show of the podcast specifically to that. Uh, you have written in the past about the so-called Integrity Initiative, and okay. it's a really, really big subject. We don't have time now to mm -hmm. explain everything, but can you just shortly give a small snippet why is the Integrity Initiative so important? And if one of you wants to know more about Integrity Initiative, you can type in in Google Kit Clarenberg and you can see all the text that uh, he has written on Yeah, that. I mean, I think that's about two or three episodes. Um, yeah, um, definitely, yeah. definitely. But yeah, just a small snippet. <laughs> no, no, so, I'm, I'm, but I'm, they can read the text, you know, absolutely. until the next episode. Yeah, but I think, okay, so the Integrity Initiative is a secret British intelligence operation which is staffed by veterans of, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, MI5, MI6, various military intelligence units. And they're goal was to spread endlessly black propaganda um, demonizing Russia and China and also um, domestic enemies such as Jeremy Corbyn and uh, Julian Assange and um, uh, they uh, they did this through a number of mechanisms but but, but by creating what they called clusters uh, these were secret networks 
of politicians, journalists, think, uh, academics, think tank pundits, yeah, you name it, uh, where they would feed um, this uh, propaganda, but also coordinate social media, um, uh, you know, kind of seemingly organic social media activity, all retweeting each other, amplifying each other, you know, scripted discussions um, in order to push particular narratives. And, you know, they boasted of how the second they set up a cluster in a country, they can alter fundamentally public perceptions and media coverage. Uh, they say, you know, within three months we will have we can we can change a, a country that's allied with Russia into an enemy. Uh, and they did this. In, they did this in Spain with great effect um, in uh, in 2017. And the the, you know, the 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 core purpose of this, from from the uh, the perspective of the lunatics running it, was to wake up the public to quote unquote the threat of Russian aggression, which seems to have only existed in their minds. You know, I mean, Russia was not engaged di in direct hostility with Spain, with Netherlands, with you know any part of the world actually. But uh, in a, a, a internal memo that these these crazy crazy people drafted, they refer to how um, if no catastrophe happens to wake people up, we will have to create a catastrophe of our own or several catastrophes. Now, say for instance, they framed Brexit, uh, which was you know due to very much due to domestic political and economic factors and social factors within the UK as a result of, as the result of Russian meddling and therefore a, a deliberate uh, direct attack on British democracy by the Kremlin and it, it led to a significant proportion of the public um, you know seeing Russia as a threat and wanting their leaders to take action you know they, you know, it, uh, uh, you know they did the same in the US they were involved in Russia gate uh, all over the world they pushed these narratives. That, you know, this notion that, that the, the West is already at war with Russia when it wasn't true. And, you know, an enduring legacy of this, I would argue, is the conflict in Ukraine. Because by turning publics and governments without their knowledge or consent against the Russians, it meant that, you know, constructive dialogue all became all but impossible. Um, you know, any Russian desire and intention became somehow sinister and, you know, bad faith, uh, you know, with, uh, uh, you know, ulterior motives. Um, and then, you know, and yes, it, 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 it effectively demonized, um, you know, uh, people who were calling for cordial, constructive relations with Moscow. And yes, we live with the legacy of it to this day. Yeah, and I think it's definitely a good subject for the next time. Uh, yeah. Mr. Klarberg, thanks for being part of our podcast. It's, it's and, yeah, see you next time and thanks for watching. Thanks for watching.